Um, uh, will AI predominantly displace jobs or will it also create new job opportunities? And what types of jobs are at the highest risk of being automated? And what new roles might emerge? Doug. I think it'll do both. So I think if you look back at technologies, whether it's um, technologies that came in from the Industrial Revolution or post-electricity or um, the, you know, the, the computer breakthroughs in the 50s, 60s and 70s, there were jobs that rapidly disappeared and there were others that blossomed. You know, and for me, one of the exciting things about AI is the marriage between people that are computational and AI experts and people that are content experts in other areas, whether that's environmental science or physics or quantum or biology or medicine. So I think there will always be a place for people who have the deep creativity that look at the world in different ways and then can harness what is just another tool to be able to make breakthroughs and discoveries that do something for the community. Mm. I'm really optimistic about it. I think Doug makes a great point that AI really is a tool um, and it is something that does automation for us. It's not a, yet a living thing that has a mind of its own. It's something that humans are directing and using. And I think that we've seen this conversation pop up time and time again when new technologies come to the fore. We look at uh, mechanised, like, what do they call them, production lines, and people used to go, oh, no, the robots are taking our jobs. We looked at photography and we said, oh, no, you know, cameras are taking the jobs of painters. But there are always things that change and new jobs that come up. There are jobs now that never existed even five years ago. Um, I think, so I think, I think that there'll always be... I think this is different. I think it's a risk to think we're just at another stage, like when the outsourcing era came and we were outsourcing jobs. I think the coming of AI is different. I, I... Certainly, I think it's extremely powerful. I don't think that there's really been many technologies that have come around that are as powerful or as easily accessible as AI. Right. But at the same time, I think perhaps it's a danger to view it as something that's out of our control and something that well, has a mind. Well, certainly it could be in our control, but is it? <laughs> well, I, I, it's, a, it's an impossible question to answer. We don't know the answer. And mm. anyone who gives you a number, 47% of jobs are at risk of automation, I think, is just making it up. Um, it's complex because... Well, what kind of jobs? The question was quite specific about the kinds of jobs that it, we've got. It's complex because we have to factor in the changing demographics of our, of our society. Uh, you have to... Maybe we're going to work less. Wouldn't that be great? Uh, we're seeing... But wait, do we get paid the same? Well, that, that, that's a great, great follow-on question. There are experiments underway, very big experiments, hundreds of thousands of people, looking at a four-day week here in Australia, in Europe, um, and discovering two remarkable facts. The first remarkable fact is that people are just as productive. They do as much work in those four days as they used to do in the five, so you can pay them as much. And secondly, and this is remarkable, they are happier. Who would have imagined it? We work there and, and we're happy. And, and we forget the weekend was an industrial of the first wave of automation. Um, when, when, we, when we started the Industrial Revolution, workers starting in the northeast of England demanded Sunday off to go to church. They got Sunday off. Then they demanded Saturday afternoon off to rest, all of Saturday. And then for some strange reason, and I've never understood why, we stopped asking for more. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a very profit-driven thing. I think if people started using AI in the jobs that they have now, like ChatGPT, for example, to make their jobs easier, I don't think that companies would then go, wow, you're getting five days worth of work done in three, therefore you can have two days off. They'll just go, wow, I can give you more work. Yeah. And I think that that's a really big cultural shift. <laughs> I'm going to float the idea of universal basic income. Yeah. Right, well, that would be interesting. That's Wild. a good segue. <laughs> so, the World Economic Forum quotes, by 2025, 85 million jobs that exist today will be replaced and done by AI, but 97 million new jobs will be created. Who's clapping? <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the other more alarming... Um, projections is that 90% of the jobs of those 85 million that will be lost will be the jobs of women, minorities and youth. And that deeply concerns me because it's a lot of the entry level jobs. So to your question, it's customer service, it's retail, it's hospitality, it's tourism, it's 
banking and finance, insurance, where where women, minorities, and youth have often um, worked. Mm. So, so that's deeply uh, concerning to me. And picking up on what Rad said, it's the first time that we AI commentators internationally are talking seriously about potentially a basic universal income being associated where there is mass job loss. Mm. Wow. Uh, Michael, you've got a growing business. Do you see opportunities and potential losses? How do you view it? Well, remember, I view this as a tool. And for the last six years, my company, Q Control, has been building AI agents. Now, this was in an era when we didn't talk about AI. It was before ChatGPT. It was when this was called machine learning or, yep. or something uh, similar. Um, the, the trick in all this is that it's really hard to make AI, in air quotes, do things in a useful way. It's really easy to make it look like it's doing something useful. So there are all these great yeah. studies. <laughs> There, there, are, there are great studies, great or examples, where scientists go to ChatGPT and say, explain to me you know, this medical phenomenon or this uh, scientific phenomenon. And it gives this beautiful, eloquent answer, complete with citations, and all the citations are made up, right? <laughs> it, is, it is finding patterns in language to try to connect things. Now, this is obviously not the end state of this technology. Yeah, that's right? what, that was but, my follow-up. So, <laughs> that's so my now. Point, so my, but, but my point is... Trying to make these agents do useful things is really hard. Now, that's all we focus on, right? We're talking about actually manipulating individual atoms and things that obey the rules of quantum mechanics, and it can't be, like, close enough for government work. It actually needs to work. And so... Uh, <laughs> that was... That was a low blow. <laughs> but I, I, I think the point is there's still a long way to go. And the opportunity is really that it unlocks new things. Now, there are risks, this is true. I would say of the pattern of risks that were identified a moment ago, you can take that and step and repeat back to uh, calculators and computerization and all sorts of technology that came before. It's always the same people who are disadvantaged, unfortunately. That is something that as a society we need to address as opposed to thinking that But each time we don't. Well, that's, that, that's right, but that has that, nothing to do with the technology. That has to do with society and governance, that's right. right? That is actually true. So how do we fix that? <laughs> I'm putting it on you. Thank you for that. Yeah, Thank no you for problem. the easy question. I'm here to help. We, we need a politician we could blame on the planet. Uh, <laughs> I'll, we'll do that next week. Um, uh, we're not blaming anyone here. This is solutions journalism. Um, honestly, can we do it differently next time? I mean, I haven't seen many signs of it, but I'm wondering. I think you have to bring those communities into the conversation very early, you know? Maybe... <laughs> And then we have to, you know, in the medical space, we have to think very carefully about the data sets that we're training the algorithms on. So there's some wonderful work being done on AI reading mammography. Mm -hmm. And so we know there are differences between different ethnic groups. So if we have uh, a set that's only trained on the mammograms from Caucasian women, they're not going to be widely useful. So. You know, as a healthcare system, we need to be ensuring that the sets of data that we bring together are really inclusive of the patients that we want to serve. Mm.